So, um, it's on parables uh, from the Gleichnissen, and of course it's interesting in German, um, Gleichnis is similarity. Um, many complain that the words of the wise are always merely parables and of no use in daily life, which is the only life we have. <laughs> I mean, you know, the guys is a riot. Okay. <laughs> when the sage sa says, go over, ge hinuba. Okay, go over, ge, go uh, over there, ge hinuba. He does not mean that we should cross to some actual place. Which we could do anyhow, if the labor were worth it. He means some fabulous yonder, sagenhaftes drüben, okay, uh, uh, some fabulous, if it's not really fabulous, sagenhaftes, I don't know how you would translate that, but, you know, quite remarkable. Uh, um, <coughs> drüben, you know, da drüben, over there. Some, some sagenhaft is also, <laughs> it's just like, I don't know how to put it in English. You know, it's it, it's it's something that you that is is um, is really worth saying. Sagenhaft, right? It's a, it's remarkable. It's noteworthy. Drum, okay, over there, something unknown to us. Something too that he cannot designate more precisely. Which it goes back perhaps to your question of designation, and therefore cannot help us here in the very least. All these parables really set out to say merely that the incomprehensible is incomprehensible, and we know that already. <laughs> it's funny, one can speak that way and you can hear it, right? It's like, oh yeah, the incomprehensible is the incomprehensible, we know that. We've heard it, everybody knows it. Read it. But the cares we have to struggle with every day, that is a different matter. The cares are those womit wir uns jeden Tag abmühen, so that which we have to concern ourselves with every day, that's a different matter. Concerning this, a man once said, okay, now we just had the first paragraph, which seems to be a kind of comment on parables. And then the second paragraph really goes into a parable form. And one way we know it's a parable form is that um, there's a man, right? Could be any man, could be every man, could be no man, um, who's going to say something which is enigmatic and which it will be important for us to be able to interpret. Now, there are those who say that parables, at least from the Christian tradition, are always didactic and they're always about lessons on how to live. Uh, words from the wise that have to be properly interpreted in order to practice a good life. Uh, interpretation is possible, interpretation can be implemented in the course of living a good life and <coughs> even a Christian life. So then suddenly this parabolic um, excursus begins Concerning this, a man said, why such reluctance? If you only follow the parables, you yourselves would become parables, and with that, rid of all your daily cares. Another said, I bet that is also a parable. The first said, you have won. The second said, but unfortunately, only in parable. <laughs> The first said, no, in reality, in parable you have lost. <laughs> so this brings us back to the question of whether we can treat parables as textually autonomous. Like maybe what's happening is simply textual, and the text has a kind of autonomy, and we don't need to look outside the text to understand it. Um, that would be a kind of textual formalism that would stand over and against social historical <coughs> readings, readings that seek to put the parable in a set of literary conventions or 
um, uh, uh, psychological readings, psychoanalytic readings, even strongly theoretical readings that are not based on close textual um, analysis, but bring their concepts to bear on a piece like this and see their concepts um, actualized there. Um, but it seems to me that the parable is making it just a little bit difficult for us to be um, complete textual formalists at this moment because the parable is constantly pointing to a reality at the same time that, that it is unclear whether that reality is inside the parable or outside the parable. So what is inside the text and what is outside the text is a problem for the parable. Right? It is, the, we might say, it's the problem that the parable is actually interrogating. So if we come with our, 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 our theoretical armature, right, um, I'm going to figure out what this text means by looking outside the text, seeing what its allusions are, its references are, its history, its context, and then I'll do a reading. <coughs> We've refused at least some dimension of the text from the start. If we understand the parable as only being a kind of commentary on language and on its own language, and we need not look anywhere outside of it, we've also possibly refused the parable from another direction. So one could say that the parable is already in, and I'm not saying this is an intention of Kafka, so certainly is, is not or could not be, uh, if, even if it were, it wouldn't matter. Um, one could say that the parable is um, contesting the ease with which we collapse into linguistic formalism or contextualization and historicism. Okay, what's inside, what's outside? Now, this parable uh, begins, and in fact, we never quite know when we're in the parable, right? Is the first paragraph a parable? Or does it begin only when it cites a certain kind of parabolic language? Concerning this, a man once said, okay, so that's good, that we can identify that. Oh, it sounds like a parable. But the first part is maybe more confusing. Many complain that the words of the wise are always merely parables and of no use in daily life. Or, oh, we don't know who the many are. We don't, know, we don't even know if it's true. We have no way to document the claim. We don't know who's speaking, okay? Many complain that the words of the wise are always merely parables and of no use in daily life, an opposition between what a parable is and utility which is the only life we have. So parables are of no use in the only life we have. They are useless in the only life we have. Is it possible that they could have a value or meaning which would be different from <coughs> usefulness? If it turns out they have a value or meaning that's different from usefulness, then the didactic function of the parable is being put into question because we're supposed to be able to use the wisdom from parables to implement them in our lives and become and live better lives or become good Christians or whatever it is that didactic parables are supposed to teach us to do. When the sage, Devaiza, says, go over, and this is a kind of major, um, it's, a, it's a command, it's an imperative, gay hinova, um, he does not mean that we should cross to some actual place. Now here, um, we have the repetition of the command structure, which we saw in the earlier parable. And we also have this problem of what it means to be going to a place that is no place. Right? Like from here, a here that is no here. Right? We would be compelled to be, go away from any here. So if we're going big from here, that means we are not going to a locatable here. And in, and, and, so, and in this case, when the wise person says, Gehinuva, cross over, really I would say cross over, cross over to the next world, like we're waiting for the object, <laughs> right? But the object fails to come, right? We, we, we hear that as a kind of expectation, but it is 
It is denied to us, right? So it's not present. We're living in a different, we're being asked to entertain, entertain a different kind of problem than the one that would satisfy our need to know to what place. Gehinuba, go over, cross over. He does not mean we should cross to some actual place, which we could do anyhow if the labor were worth it. That's man of the other side. Okay, so in the German, gehe hinüber, so meint er nicht, he does not mean that das man auf die andere Seite hinüber gehen solle, that one should go over to the other side. Um, was man immerhin noch leisten konnte, wenn das Ergebnis des Weges wert wäre, sondern der meint, oh goodness gracious, um, which we could do anyway if the labor were worth it. I wonder, is that true? Could we get to the other side if the labor were worth it? Is it just that the labor's not worth it to get to the other side? What is the other side? Is the other side a place or is it no place? It's not useful. One thing we're learning is like, oh, who would want to go there? It's not useful. We could do it, but it's not useful. Okay, so whatever that means to go to this place that is no place is not going to be useful. Um, um, wenn das Ergebnis des Weges wert wäre, here he says if it were of, of use or of, of worth, so then er meint irgendein sanghaftes Tun, some kind of remarkable as, elsewhere, etwas, something that we can't know, um, and that uh, even from him, the wise man cannot be more precisely designated. Um, and so can't really help us. There's no help to us. Okay. Remember the other parable, my destination, nothing was going to help. Nothing was going to save him. No, no, no provision was going to save him. And we, we have this idea here as well of being, um, of being without help, and necessarily so. Um, all these parables really set out to say merely that the incomprehensible is incomprehensible. We know that already. We can't possibly know that already if it is incomprehensible. But we can see in the phrase how even the incomprehensible can be so banalized <laughs> that we think we know it. It becomes a cliché. Oh yeah, Derrida, it's about the incomprehensible. <laughs> um, but the care that we have to struggle with every day, that is a different matter. Okay, is that true? There's an incomprehensibility, an indeterminacy that belongs to parable that um, is exemplified in the go over, the wise man's imperative, <clears throat> which we either cannot do or we could do if it were possible, but it wouldn't be of worth to do. And what is this go over anyway? It doesn't help us with our daily cares, our daily tasks. That's a different thing. Concerning this, this, what is that, Dachauf? Concerning all of that, which part of that? A man once said, Sachte einer. Why such reluctance? Von wert ihr euch? Why defend yourself? If you only followed the parables, you yourselves would become parables, and with that, rid of all your daily cares. Now, this seems to be a moment. What does it mean to follow a parable? Well, it doesn't mean to take its wisdom and implement it in a practice. If you follow it, you yourself would, in some sense, go over, <laughs> go over into the parable, go over to the parable, become the parable. 
you would, you would transform or transubstantiate and you would yourself become a parable. You'd relinquish this life, which apparently has some cares in it, and you would become a parable. Transubstantiation, redemption, maybe transformation. Um, and with that, rid of all your daily cares. So you would treat the parable as a, a place of transcendence and you would imagine reading the parable as a transubstantiation or a, or a an act through which you become what you read. You go over into the parable and are rid of your daily cares. Now there are, of course, certain romantic poets who said that's precisely what we should do. We should, we should, we should, we should read those texts that transform us and give us transcendence or redemption. And that it would be in, in and through the reading or the going over into the aesthetic domain that we would have, we would be able to achieve that transcendence and be rid of our daily cares, live in a more rarefied aesthetic domain, or indeed a more rarefied religious domain. Another said, "I bet that is also a parable, suggesting that it's not reality or it's not doable. It can't be done, or that that it is telling us something." but it's not a literal command that we should or could um, uh, obey or follow. I bet that is also a parable, at which point the parable seems to be a sign of reality also, a mode of deflating a transcendent expectation. The first said, you have won. Hask have won. We didn't know we were in a fight or a battle or a contest, but apparently we were. And that is true because even in the first paragraph there's something of a quarrel going on between the wise man who says go over and the voice that is narrating this that says Psh, useless, useless, useless can't help us with our daily cares. Then another voice comes and says, become a parable, another kind of imperative. And then a second voice, now distinct, says that that's a parable. The one who said, become a parable, says you won. The second said, but unfortunately only a parable because you and I are nothing other than two voices in Kafka's parable. We don't have an independent <laughs> existence. <laughs> You've got to admit, okay, you know, we're not even people, we don't have a name, we, you know, we're nothing, we're just whatever this textual moment of enunciation is. Uh, unfortunately, I'm stuck in this parable, how about you? <laughs> and the first said, no, in reality, in parable you've lost. So the first one we will remember why defend yourself? If only you would follow the parable, you'd become one. And the second one says, <coughs> only a parable. First one says, you've won. It's true, it's only a parable. Um, the second one says, but unfortunately, only in parable. Lied up, it's too bad. It's just a parable. It would be great to win in reality. And the first one says, no, in reality, in parable, you have lost. Why is that? Why that final line? Does it relate to the usefulness? Well, the one who's doubting, who's defending itself, at least in the first paragraph, is the one who's saying, going over, becoming parallel, you're <laughs> doing these transcendent exercises is useless. I've got I've got cares here. So it's the second one who says, Yeah, I've won by saying that what you just said was parable, but unfortunately only in parable. It's the first one who says, no, in reality, in parable you've lost. 
when the first one says no in reality, which sense, what does reality mean? In what sense is that reality? really peculiar. Like in this dialogue or in real life? You know. Well, the thing is, even the very last line, the first said, no in reality in parable you've lost. It's still a voice in a parable. Yeah. <laughs> and at that moment, we lean in, right? Like, oh, something's being said about reality. And then we realize, oh, this is a parable. <laughs> Reality is something other than parable. Reality is something other than parable. Seems to be an opposition. On the other hand, every time reality is asserted, it's within the context of a parable, at which point the conditions of its articulation constrain our understanding of it. Right? Is it really outside? I mean, I can't, I can't, I can't shake that reality out of that last line. Not outside. <coughs> All right, let's ask a slightly different question. What does it mean to win in parable, or win in reality, or lose in parable, or lose in reality? What's being won or lost? I mean, there's a bet. I bet that's also a parable. And the first said, you've won. You won the bet. There was a wager. There was a wager going on. You told me I should make myself into a parable and that I would be rid of all my daily cares. <laughs> and then the one who's listening to, to that says, I bet that's a parable. In other words, I can't really do that. I can't make that happen. And the first says, yeah, you've won. You've won. He's saying, oh yeah, I sold you a bill of a bad bill of goods. Did I lead you down the wrong path? Did I tell you to do something you couldn't do? You've won. It's parable. And the second said, yeah, but unfortunately only in parable. But only one in the parable, not in reality. Still not able to implement this imperative you gave me to become a parable. The first said, no, in reality you won. In parable you've lost. If in reality you won, then you actually see, because what does that one see? That one sees that what the parable says to do is not exactly what can be implemented in, in life, and that this incommensurability between what the parable says to do, gay hinuba, become a parable, cannot be directly implemented in life as a, as a practice Right as a as a way of as a moral practice as a Christian practice as a as a practice of any kind. So, if the traditional parable was supposed to be didactic and show us how to live, this parable shows us that the command or the imperative, okay, he do become a, a, par a parable meets its limit in reality, and reality is, is the non-implementability of the imperative. And not similar. It's not similar. Well, it is similar in the sense that we think this is a command we might obey, mm -hmm. and which might help us. But in the end, the command, even the injunction to transcend, Gehenuba, or to transubstantiate, <laughs> both of which are very intense religious uh, injunctions, um, can be read and understood to some degree but cannot be enacted. Something called the cares of life are not set, are, not, are neither transcended nor settled 
through the implement through following the imperative. In other words, the non-followability, the fact that the imperative cannot be followed is where reality disjoins from parable, and yet it's that very disjunction which is not only the topic of this parable, but the problem of parable. The problem of parable. It wasn't always the problem of parable. Apparently there was a day you could tell a parable and somebody would get it and it would help them live their life in a better way or it would set them on the path towards transcendence. So what do we have? We have something like the relic of a former set of imperatives. We have the, the ruin of a commandment. We have um, the echo of a set of theological injunctions that we can still hear and partially respond to, but which are no longer uh, practically implemented or no longer sufficient to settle the cares of daily life. And so a certain incommensurability between command and action seems to, seems to structure, characterize this particular dilemma of the parable. Let's take a couple questions on this and then I, I want to say some further. Did you, did you want to say something? No. no. Yeah, please. I have a uh, question for maybe for clarification and expansion. I was wondering what, um, what is the concept of space uh, that we would apply such that uh, you could be in reality or in parable, and furthermore, such that reality wouldn't fit within the parable, and the parable wouldn't fit within the reality, because um, I guess what I'm understanding from what you're saying is that it's a kind of a uh, question about transcendentalism. I mean, the transcendental idea, it, it would make sense, because there could be something above or below. But I think, yeah, I'm kind of struggling with that, uh, you know, what the concept of space would be that we fit in those things but they don't fit within each other. Maybe there's a liminal aspect to it. Well, it seems to me, well, two things. First of all, um, as transcendental philosophy understood as Kantian philosophy, which is the inquiry into the a priori conditions of our not. Okay. There is an idea of the transcendent, which would be um, that which transcends what is imminent, or uh, what is uh, what what belongs properly to an empirical or apparent world. And then there is transcendentalism, which tends to be associated with. Um, American transcendentalists like Emerson um, and certain philosophies in nature, so they're slightly different. It seems to me that the, that what's happening here in Kafka is an idea of being able to transcend what we might understand as the sphere of imminence or ordinary, the ordinary phenomenal and empirical world. So not exactly the Kantian project. Um, and it's not exactly the project of transcendental philosophy um, of, of the American kind, or indeed um, uh, of, of various forms. We can think of Hindu transcendental philosophy, for instance. Um, we have two examples so far in, our, in the small archive we're making, and one of them comes from Das Ziel, um, where we have this idea of um, a vague from here and away from here, which is enormous um, and outside of conce conceptualization. And here again, we have this idea of a fabulous yonder in Unparables, Sallenhaft is Trunen, which cannot be more precisely designated even by the very wise. So something that's not quite conceptualizable, not quite designatable, um, 
and it seems to be named, referred to within the parable itself. And so the parable is not going to be able to designate it for us or conceptualize it. So we have to ask what kind of linguistic moment is this, where something is, um, um, I guess I would, I would use the word um, that Benjamin uses for Kafka's language, um, something is gestured toward. There's a, there's a gesturing toward uh, a, a, some kind of possibility that is not fully comprehensible, designatable, or conceptualizable. And that happens in the course of the parable. And I'm not sure it's, it can be extracted from the parable and made into a kind of separate theoretical entity without conceptualizing it, designating it, uh, uh, demarcating it in some way that would, in some sense, ruin the ruin, ruin the kind of thing that it is. You know, um, Kafka's language is it's an etwas. You know, it's a something, but not really quite a noun. And even when we give it a noun form, it seems to be an impossible noun form. Big from here. Um, so, so something's happening when language gestures toward this possible kind of transcendence, but it doesn't go there. It doesn't give it to us. It doesn't incarnate it. It, it doesn't embody it completely. It doesn't designate it precisely. So it's neither a symbolic incarnation of the, of the beyond in the parable. Can't do that. Nor does it refer to it in a in a clear conceptual way, such that we could extract it from the parable and carry it with us as a theoretical moment of that kind. Yeah. A question. Um, and I don't know if I work this out properly for myself, but to what <coughs> extent here <coughs> could we talk about the, the problem of, of translation within the parable itself? Is in this kind of, as you were saying before the break, the way that something in, this, in these texts or in Kafka is being opened and then also closes yes. and negates the possibility in this in these communications that are occurring that are double the many layered. I mean there's the communication of the parable to its reader, there's the communication of these um, speakers within parables. Mm -hmm. So far the two that we've read there's always a duel somehow of one says and another responds not to be not necessarily appropriately or in a way in which this communication is fluid. And I'm just wondering how <clears throat> this is problematizing understanding itself um, as a problem of translation mm -hmm. in, in the way of, is a translation something that creates similarity? Is it, or is it something that creates kind of a dissonance, um, a friction, a dissimilarity? Is that how it communicates what, what, um... Well, I don't know. Um, it seems to me, I mean, one, one thing that is, I'm, I'm not sure if we can move to the question of translation exactly, although when commands are given, both times, I, I commanded that my horse be brought, or gay hinuba go over, cross over, um, Transcend. It's uh, a command to, to transcend. Well, it it seems to be that it seems to be that uh, each time there seems to be a bit of a commentary, right? He didn't understand me. It wasn't clear. Sort of I, you know, even if we could do it and I could do it, it wouldn't be worthwhile. You know, there's there's a lot of bantering commentary that that those commandments um, engender. So it's not, so the question is not how do I translate that language into another language, but can 
I actually follow the, can, can anyone follow the imperative? Right? It seems like the servant can't follow. There's a crisis in the commandment right there. And it seems like in the parable, it's really not possible to follow, except in the parable. But that's, for me, this open closing possibility of them, this bet. You know, like, winning in parable, losing in parable. Winning in reality, losing in reality. This impossible following is perhaps a form of winning in the sense of understanding by not following, by being dissimilar to the parable, in the sense of... Uh, Maybe um, there's another way to see it, in the same way that... Um, um, an, an? An, an love? Oh, an, okay. I think um, su suggested to us that even in that enormous journey, it was unclear whether he was going to get provision along the way. It didn't say there would be no provision along the way. Mm -hmm. It was a wager. Mm -hmm. It was a risk. Mm -hmm. And here again, it's a wager. Um, and it doesn't exactly, the end of the parable doesn't resolve the issue. Right? Because we, first of all, we don't know whether the final line is the truth. Oh, we expect the final line to give us the truth. <laughs> but maybe the final line simply reiterates the structure. And that there is this kind of wager. Or, or it's, it's not just an inversion, but a kind of wager. And, and of course, there's a question of whether we are following. Like there's a command to be followed, but then there's some other kind of reading that we're doing. We're following line by line. Are we able to follow? <coughs> Even if we do follow, will we be able to transform this into a kind of practical dimension of life that will help us with our daily cares? Unclear. Um, and the problem, of course, is that we never get out of the parable within the parable, and yet the parable is constantly referring to this reality outside. The parable doesn't actually function as a complete transcendence of daily life, but it's a, it's a, it does give us a particular kind of textual space and time in which a meta-commentary on the problem of reality and parable becomes possible. Something other than a religious solution or a complete transcendence, and yet it is a different kind of time and space than that which would belong to the putative world of daily cares, of locatable bodies in, that move from place to place. So we might ask what's the, what's the status of the of the fictional text in relationship to this divided world, ordinary cares, transcendent beyond. Is there, is there something of a local, provisional, transcendent beyond or fabulous yonder that the parable actually is, even though it can't translate into religious instruction or permanent transcendence? I'm going to take these two questions, and then I, I want to s say some other things about this before we lose our time. Okay. Thank you. Um, if this is my question also about sort of the translatability between well, what we're saying, the translatability between the parable and the real, or this what we're positing as the real, um, where the real is actually itself inside the parable, uh, or re the real being in this case, I shouldn't say the real the daily life. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was really interesting the way it began, and the narrator says, yeah, we know the incomprehensible is incomprehensible, but our knowledge of the other every day is another matter. So there, to me, there was an insinuation there that actually we don't know about the every day. Um, um, and then I wonder, you know, if you, 
you mentioned Derrida. Yeah, we all know Derrida means incomprehensible. Right. But it made me think of what is uh, often an in incomprehensible uh, concept in that pas de, de text, mm -hmm. right? There mm -hmm. being there's no outside text, mm -hmm. which I think is maybe what this parable. I'm seeing this parable as sort of a, a um, conversation about. Yeah. The only, um, well, the only problem I see with that, well, it depends on how you read the Derridian claim, but um, I did hear him talk about that once, and he didn't want it read as a case for complete um, linguistic formalism that would, in, that would ratify the autonomy of the text. He was afraid that that was a kind of new criticism. But maybe more that there was um, meaning is constructed in relation. You know, our everyday life or life is, is related to the text in this way, that the text in, informs life. Well, not his own. In a way, but even the, even the inyapa, the why, in the inyapa, which is the there. It's there in the sentence, but it's also in a referential relation, but its referentiality cannot be extricated from its thereness in the sentence. And I think maybe something similar happens with Kafka, where um, uh, the, the place that is no place um, is referred to, and it even is to a certain extent referring self-referentially to the parable, or even to the sense of the uncanny or the enormity or the incomprehensibility that is within daily life. Right? It's not like daily life is so analytically, in, you know, separable from this idea of the incomprehensible. So that if the incomprehensible is within daily life, and this mm, this there to which we're to go is already in some sense in this peculiar kind of here, the here of the parable, which is no localizable place, um, then we're seeing how that operation works, like. It, 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 as necessarily locked together, not, not as an either or, but as a kind of, um, as, as two issues that are inextricably related, which would mean that that parable and reality are inextricably related, although not the same, they're not similar in that way, <laughs> implicated in one another and also in some ways um, uh, um, d different or re repelling one another. So, let me just take a few minutes um, before we we break to maybe go over this just a little bit. Um, in in Dastil, in my destination, the question of going somewhere got opened up, and I think we saw that again in in the parable and parables. And it seems to me we were never sure whether the master was actually going. There's no textual evidence to support the fact that he would got through the gate. And it would be difficult um, to arrive somewhere that didn't eventually become a here. Um, how can one go away from here without moving from one here to another? I would say that more generally, there are questions of departure and arrival that um, that are being reflected upon in both of these parables and in most of the parables we will read. Um, is there an arrival? It, is there an arrival? Like anywhere? I'm like, why, why put it between departure and arrival? And what's the, where's the right? Where is it's, the, it's about, uh, as I see it, it's about crossing a gate. Uh, 
Cross them over. Call two without object? Without the object? The object is not something that you can grasp. Not here. Not here. Not, uh, so it's the, but this is why it's the question of arrival. Right? So it's why it's the question of arrival. I would stop at the question. I, it's uh, it's depart, departure. More than okay, so when we look at something like the imperial message, there's a question of whether the message can arrive. When we look at before the law, mm -hmm. there's a question of whether the door will open and the man will be able to walk through mm -hmm. and arrive at the law. Mm -hmm. So the question of arrival haunts many of the parables that we'll be looking at. And you're right that non-arrival tends to be uh, confirmed time and again. Okay, time and again, non-arrival. Threshold. Well, if we just stayed at threshold, that would be one thing. But because there is very often within the parables um, an expectation of arrival, a question of arrival, a waiting for someone or something to arrive, we're left with this unfulfilled moment. And there are different ways of understanding that. Um, in fact, Sholem, Sholem and Benjamin argue about this very issue. Um, uh, so um, what I want to suggest to you is that many of our usual ideas of departure and arrival assume a distinct possibility of a temporal trajectory across a spatial continuum. Right? We can move through time from one place to another. But what Kafka's parables are beginning to do, I think, is questioning both the temporal and the spatial presumptions we make about, um, about going. <laughs> okay, let's just leave it like that, going. Um, um, the, although the vague font here, I suggest it is a place name. It holds the name of a place within a recognizable grammatical form, right? It's readable. I mean, it's a interesting new grammatical coinage, but it's readable. The grammar not only diverges from clear referentiality, <coughs> to what place would this vague font here correspond, for instance. Um, but the grammatical form does something that is at odds with any sense of reality that we might have, or that is intelligible for us. So the grammar, in some sense, <coughs> takes us, if we want to go with the journey motif, to the limits of intelligibility. And I want to suggest to you, and here actually Kafka is could be read in a more Kantian vein, Kafka comes up against the limits of space and time as conditions for intelligible knowing. Um, there seems to be no clear way of moving from point to point within the schemes that are offered within the parables, and this confounds both our ideas of temporal progression and spatial continuity. It also, I think, draws our attention more generally to what can be done with language, what kind of conjuring is possible within language, um, and if there is um, uh, as, as you may know, a, a topos, a topos is a literary convention um, uh, from the which which suggests a commonplace, um, but a topos doesn't have to have a spatial equivalent um, outside of the text for it to work within the text. Um, and if indeed, if there's any way of departing from the parable on parables, right? Do we ever get out of this parable? It may be uh, precisely by leaving the common idea of place or the common idea of going somewhere for a less common idea of place and a less common idea of going somewhere. 
We can even ask whether reading the parable is a way of going somewhere without arriving, and whether it also is uh, a, uh, the, 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 the navigation of a kind of linguistic space-time that is not the same um, as spatial and temporal, the spatial and temporal coordinates that usually govern our idea of what it is to move through space. So um, what I want to suggest to you simply is that um, I want to continue um, throughout these days together to look at Kafka. So I'm, each day we'll be reading a couple of parables together. But I would like to uh, ask you to read some Benjamin, uh, some, the conversations with Sholem, the conversations with Adorno, to see what kind of uh, commentaries and disagreements emerged um, on the basis of, of reading Kafka. Um, and my focus will be on problems of temporal progression and spatial relations that have everything to do with how we think about progressive history, ideas of teleology, the messianic, and what we might call um, even the politics of arrival and departure, which, by the way, are quite crucial to immigration politics as we're living them these days. Excuse me, you said temporal progression and spatial? Spatial continuity, spatial mm -hmm. relations, I say, but spatial continuity. Um, I also want to suggest that in thinking about these issues, um, we will invariably be thinking in part about communicability and the legitimacy of laws, whether laws can be realized, um, and also the invariable impasses produced by theological promises and expectations that, um, that operate with the assumption that they will arrive in time or in some form that we will be able to recognize. If they do not arrive in time, and if they cannot arrive in a form that we can recognize, how then are we left with the understanding of the messianic, or even more generally, of the problem of realizability? I think when we return this afternoon, I want to just start by talking a little bit about the theological problematic that gets opened up in Kafka's parables only to get closed down. And I want us to read The Coming of the Messiah. Uh, if we have time, the imperial message. But then I would like us also to take a look at Benjamin, very profoundly influenced by Kafka. And we'll look at these the theses on the philosophy of history or the concept of history. Because there, we don't have parables so much, but we do have theses. <laughs> and they are truncated linguistic forms. One question I have is how do we think about the parable in relationship to the thesis in Benjamin? And what do these truncated forms have to do with the rethinking of space and time in light of new problems of history where history is not realizing an end or where the messianic uh, promise is not uh, fulfillable or uh, actualizable. Okay. And we'll see where we get. I'm willing to go as slowly or as quickly as people wish. So what I'd like to do is do this this afternoon and then see where we are and find out from you whether you want more of the same <laughs> or whether you want to move to some other issues. Tomorrow we'll work more intensively on the Benjamin, and I, um, I'll ask you to read uh, a, a number of those essays. I, I'm presuming you have uh, illuminations, is that correct? Yes. 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 Okay, great. Those who don't have it, I can email it to you. Okay. So come to the, me after class. We'll move. We'll, we'll, do, we'll start to look at the theses this afternoon. Tomorrow we'll move more deeply into it. And tomorrow yeah. afternoon I've invited Avital and... Avital Ronell and Lawrence Rickles to join me 
and we'll do some Kafka meetings together. I assure you it will be interesting. <laughs> Great.